Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to Mapping Philippine Material Culture in Overseas Collection. Uh, we are very excited um, to be part of this project. First, um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the, the uh, attendance and um, the support of uh, Philippine Ambassador to the UK, Antonio Lagdameo, uh, who has been very supportive of this project, and of Deputy Speaker Lauren Lagarda, uh, who gave this project uh, its head start through a grant to advance Philippine studies at SOAS and the UK. Um, I'd also like to thank and acknowledge the presence of the members of our digital mapping research group, uh, a combination of graduate students and research fellows, myself included, uh, both in the UK and the Philippines, who have been working together uh, to basically geomap and georeference um, the objects uh, onto um, our database. Um, a big shout out to Jessica Manuel, who coordinates the team at UP, um, along with Ana Robles, Francesca Aliana, Lou Viri, and Chiara Martinez, all the way from San Carlos University in Cebu. Um, also, um, we'd like to thank the curators uh, for Southeast Asian collections uh, from um, a range of institutions um, who are hopefully also here, um, and to um, establish a collaborative links with SOAS um, and the project. We especially say hello to uh, Francine Brinkgreve at the um, uh, uh, Ethnology Museum in Leiden. Um, here to give the go ahead for including one of the most important collections of Philippine material culture in Europe outside Spain. Um, we'd also like to acknowledge Sinta uh, Kraha, uh, uh, professor, uh, associate professor at the Universidad Autonoma de Madrid, um, who will coordinate the research team uh, for phase two of the project, uh, the monumental task of adding Philippine collections in Spain into the inventory. Uh, along with Alberto Vela, uh, Manuel Corcelas, Ana Gutierrez, and Father Jesus Folgado Garcia. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn um, the screen over to Cristina Juan, who is the project head of Philippine studies at SOAS and lead researcher of this, uh, of this project. So Cristina, um, on to you to launch the archive officially. Thanks. Thank you, Nixi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, um, I come to this project with uh, both uh, humility and ambition. Uh, when we began uh, with mapping Philippine objects in the UK for our initial grant, um, we just could not stop. Uh, yeah, we just couldn't stop in the board or within the borders of the UK. It just became harder to um, not include whatever else was out there, the, the object lists were just so amazing. And we felt like we needed to go beyond the UK. So as soon as we got the ball rolling and the database tool was already set up, uh, we continued to slowly expand to Europe, uh, mostly looking for uh, digital collections and using data under the Creative Commons license. Um, uh, the terrain is, is vast and almost endless, uh, but walking through it is very addicting. And meeting Marianne certainly did not help my addiction. Um, so as soon as we sent out feelers to institutions, uh, we've been inundated with spreadsheets, listing uh, Philippine objects. Some have slim data, some have no photos, but they are there nevertheless. And um, it, it, you know, some of these objects have actually been never displayed uh, their whole life, um, almost hundreds of years in the collection. So um, I, I'm basically saying we, we are deciding to launch the beta version of the site now, even if we know that it is completely so very incomplete. Uh, uh, but we did want to do this because we wanted to begin the journey of mapping the landscape of Philippine material culture and um, to ask people uh, to come along with us in this journey. Uh, we want to open up a discursive space um, where we can begin to reclaim uh, cultural memory. Um, so um, whatever it is worth, um, the, the, the database, the tool is set up. We have made it very open-ended and very inclusive of, um, of data. So um, yeah, for whatever it's worth, um, pushing the button and declaring the site live 
uh, from here on, um, we will take down the passwords and um, and we'll give you the the link at the end of the of the event. So thank you for listening and back to Nixie. Um, we're going to move on now to um, uh, a brief presentation by Marianne Pastor Rosas, who um, is literally a legend in, in this field. Um, she's an independent curator and critic uh, working from her base in Manila in the Philippines, um, from where she takes up global art and cultural circuits as a critic of institutions um, and so on. Her most recent book in uh, 2019 is an anthology of 45 years of writing um, entitled Gathering Political Writing on Art and Culture. Uh, by uh, MCAD, the Museum of Contemporary Art and Design in Manila and Art Asia Pacific. Uh, without further ado, let us um, switch to Marianne Pastorosas. Marianne? Magandang umaga, hapon o gabi, whichever <laughs> one may be in your part of the world. Uh, thank you, Christina. Ambassador Lagdameo and uh, Representative Lauren Legarda, uh, thank you for supporting this project. It's it uh, has been a long time coming. And so the first thought that entered my mind when Christina said, it's on, we're going live, is uh, a bit of a shock that there was a tremendous amount of interest now. Uh, even the participants today uh, actually has been a bit of a shock to me. But I think you'll know why when I tell you that this thing has been going on for a long time and there's been very little interest over the last decades. And suddenly, boom, there's interest. But having said that, I'm uh, surprised at the interest. I'm also a little bit worried because I know that all of you here who, who come here have come for, for different reasons and that there's very little that uh, a speaker can do in about 30 minutes to an hour of packing things from a uh, I mean, I can't describe the extent of this um, this field, uh, this material culture field. It, it's impossible uh, to to give it an adjective. And so, yes, uh, all you people there, some of you are my friends who are interested in weaponry. You're not going to see 100 weapons tonight. I'm sorry, we can't put it in. Um, and those who are who are interested in textiles, you're not going to see too many textiles either because we've, I've had to put all sorts of things here. So having said that, what I can promise you in my brief presentation is uh, a bit of a map. And it's a rather good metaphor. How to navigate a vast um, and, and scattered resource. Uh, I, will, I won't be the only person who can give you a, a navigational tool. Uh, this is precisely why this is an institutional effort, and it's an effort of two countries, as a matter of fact, and universities in, in different places in the world, and museums in different places in the world. So uh, a map, therefore, let's use it as a metaphor. I'll end with mapping as a metaphor, and I am now going to share my screen. Uh, I am disabled. Can you help me, uh, Christina, my screen? I can't share my screen. Sorry, not yet. Okay, sorry. Can't find you, Marianne. Well, if it's uh, taking a bit of time, uh, why don't you run my slides? That might be easier. Okay, actually, yeah, you can now do that. Thank you. Sorry, I thought I did that. Try oh, again. I'm yeah. On, I'm on. Thank you. Okay, I can share. Here, here it is. So we begin with the question: Why? Why on earth? Why are we doing this? Um, a huge part of the reason is personal. Um, it's it's a research interest of mine. It's been an enduring one, but uh, now it's institutional. So I'm going to try for an institutional response to the question of why. Uh, all right. In sum. There's a real urgent need for comprehension. And I, I don't usually use words like urgent uh, without being deliberate. And I hope to be able to convey that to you this evening uh, because of the scale of loss and emphasis on the word scale. 
it's vast. It's a vast unknowing. Uh, second thing is the scale of the impact of this loss on the Filipino. The third is an emotional register, the elusiveness of joy. We, we, we um, I think we're missing on a lot of delight and joy. The one that, uh, that Tina here uh, mentioned about you get addicted and I think you get addicted to it because there's a lot that is joyful and delightful. And, and it, would, it is obviously to be hoped that Filipinos will feel that joy uh, together instead of us uh, museum mice and um, people who, who do nothing but archive things. So it is to be hoped that this elusive joy because of the scale of impact of loss and the scale of the loss uh, that we can comprehend this and do something about it collectively. Um, but to comprehend it, I, I would like to uh, share with you what have always been a reality check for me. Uh, so we'll begin with the reality check. This global inventory uh, of Philippine materials will not do many things. One, it will not discover civilizational glory in the past. Uh, a lot of people go into this digging to try and find some kingdom, some great thing, something that will make us feel proud. It will make us feel proud, but not in that sense. Um, and I think once we get past this, I've discovered something great. I've discovered Parthenon, I've discovered Borobudur underneath the soil of the Philippines. Once we get past that, uh, then, then we can enjoy the things I'm talking about. Uh, the inventory will not find evidence of caste-like social hierarchies. There is hierarchy, but nothing like India, nothing even like Indonesia's Kraton. Um, we'll have to understand our materials another way. Uh, the inventory will not support the idea of non-materiality, uh, non-materially inclined cultures as primitive. So th there is a habit amongst us that if a person or a group of people, an ethno-linguistic group does not have uh, monumental um, traditions and don't have these big, big things, no monumentality. As a matter of fact, uh, most scholars believe that Philippines, the Philippines did not have monumental art, and I believe that we did not. But just because of that, does not assign people like this into the category of the primitive. Um, there's a huge amount of literature on this, and so um, I don't need to rehearse that literature. It's been going on for 50 years. Um, I wish I could speak on just that thing alone, but um, I need to move on to another, will not, uh, the inventory will not overturn, in my belief, the findings of anthropology, archaeology, and linguistics, and other uh, related fields. Um, these disciplines in the Philippines have said that um, the Philippines did not produce kingdoms, we had no kings, we had no queens, we had no uh, royalty uh, in uh, in a technical sense. And um, we will not find anything, including the gold from Butuan, uh, to merit uh, the use of words like royal or princess or king. Uh, and I'm not, um, I'm only summarizing what uh, the sciences have said about us. It will not support retroactive construction of protoforms of modern forms. In other words, um, if you're looking for the precedence of contemporary sculpture or modern sculpture, it is best not to look for protoforms because what there was in the past um, may not, and in my view, does not uh, come together as a linear, and I hate the word evolution. All right, so having gone there, I'm happy to answer questions if, um, if you're appalled by my uh, statements, but let's go to the fun parts. This is our story. Well, unfortunately, this is not the fun part yet. All right. Uh, these sound like uh, vast assertions, uh, but um, anyone who's worked in this field, there's very few of us, we hope there's more of us, will know that the material cultural heritage of the Philippines is in large measure overseas. Uh, 
outside the Philippines. And this could be as much as 90% of anything that survives from, from thousands of years to today, to even to today, as a matter of fact, because there's collecting of Philippine uh, cultural material right now by foreign museums. All right. Uh, so that's not an exaggeration, my first sentence. My second sentence, uh, is the result of the first, the that Filipinos do not have access to much of the material evidence of knowledge systems that existed in the Philippines. Um, mainly because if they're in storages in museums abroad or in private homes of collectors, then uh, access is uh, niggardly. And thirdly, among the outcomes of this uh, vast unknowing is an abysmal loss of measures of quality that Philippine peoples enjoyed until about a century ago. Now, the measures of quality are not the measures of quality in kingdoms or not the measures of quality in Europe or China or Japan, but uh, you will see in the materials that uh, are in my slides, and it's just uh, a handful, that uh, there was exquisite quality within the terms of our own traditions and within the terms of our own knowledge systems. And uh, it takes a shift of the imagination to understand that the loss is not the loss of civilizational material, but the loss, I mean, we could argue what the word civilization means, but uh, let's just use it in its popular sense right now. Uh, we can answer questions later. But yes, uh, we have stopped enjoying things uh, over the last century. A big part of it is because we don't have access. We haven't seen these things. So we need to keep a few matters in mind. Uh, that the collection of the National Museum of the Philippines was totally, nearly totally destroyed during the Second World War. And so what's left at the National Museum uh, was really what Henry Otley Bayer physically moved out of the National Museum during the bombing of Manila. And uh, I'm sure you all are aware that Manila was the second most destroyed city on earth uh, of the uh, Allied powers, um, amongst the, the allies to the Allied powers. Uh, it, it was nearly totally destroyed and so was the National Museum. Um, so well, just by way of numbers, uh, there are 300, 50 Bagobo textiles at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And there's about a dozen of pre-World War II materials uh, at the National Museum. So uh, it is an unfortunate uh, part of our national, our national life that, it, that this has not become part of the imagination of the Filipino. The second thing is that material cultural studies were, were not a significant area of work for Philippine studies during the post-war period. There was, I can, I'd, love, I'd love to discuss this with anthropologists. I'm not an anthropologist uh, nor a historian, but there was no focus on material culture in the uh, shift of focus to, um, uh, let's say kinship systems uh, and of course language. Um, thirdly, Philippine material cultural collections started to be an activity uh, in the 1970s by Filipinos. All right. There's more matters to keep in mind, the status quo. So let me just give you a sketch. The Nayong Filipino ethnographic collection is in a precarious state. It's an important collection. Uh, it's a small collection. Uh, I believe that as of a few months ago, people are trying to do something about it, but something has to be done because it's, it's among the very few that remain in the Philippines outside private collections. The National Museum was not enabled by the state to compete with bullish antiquities trade between the 1970s, indeed to today in terms of uh, collecting money. So the, whatever was left was not, uh, was, it was not possible for the National Museum to collect it from the 1970s. Uh, as a matter of fact, sorry, uh, I did say 1970s here because that's when all of the buying was happening, but in effect ever since 1945 uh, with the destruction of Manila. But the nice thing is the Philippine archaeological gold jewelry remains intact at the Banco Central ng Pilipinas and the Ayala Museum. So this um, archaeological gold jewelry did not 
in fact leave the country except for a few pieces from archaeologists who were working in the Philippines, uh, American archaeologists, and, um, and at least one Frenchman, Alfred Marsh, who, uh, who managed to find gold jewelry in a cave in Marinduque uh, in the middle of the 19th century. So yes, this gold uh, has not left. A Philippine colonial material culture remains in the Philippines in private collections, uh, not necessarily in, uh, in state collections, but the central bank has, the Central Bank of the Philippines has a collection. The Museo ng Kaalamang Katutubo, uh, which is a private, uh, private museum, is actually succeeding at gathering the Philippines reference collection for ethnographic materials. It's an ongoing project right now. Uh, Philippine modern art has been substantially collected by private parties, notably Ateneo de Manila University. Uh, and that collection has been going on since the 1950s. It's a fabulous collection. Uh, Philippine contemporary art has been substantially collected by the Singapore Art Museum. This is what's going, been going on for the last 20 years. So Singapore actually has uh, the reference collection for contemporary art of the Philippines and, and the region. Uh, Centrum Pangkultura ng Pilipinas is a cultural center of the Philippines. Uh, the private collections both in the Philippines and abroad have the contemporary art reference collection uh, collectively. 19th and early 20th century paintings are in private hands, but substantially collected by Banco Central ng Pilipinas. So you can see that Banco Central actually has been a uh, trustworthy trustee of Philippine culture, uh, and um, that we have a lot to be grateful for to the Central Bank of the Philippines. But there are many gaping lacks insofar as reference collections are concerned. For example, we do not have a Philippine design collection, um, designer chairs, design, et cetera, uh, fashion, very little. And uh, a few Filipino and foreign collectors own substantial bodies of Philippine art. And by substantial, I mean uh, exquisite and extraordinary. So that's the sketch. A number of key pieces that embody the most sublime levels of cultural expression in material form by specific uh, Philippine peoples is what is lost to the Philippines. Uh, and when I say a number, it's actually uh, a large number. A number of key pieces for which there are no equivalents in the Philippines, or there are pieces in museums abroad, I'll show you some of them that have um, that are singular. There's only one of it in the entire world. Um, then we've also lost the full range of variations of certain traditions as expressed by artists of specific communities. Meaning to say you might have one Bagobo piece or one Blaan piece or one Ifugao piece, etc. here, there, and everywhere. Um, but the range to become a reference collection does not exist in the Philippines, except for what is being built by the Museo ng uh, Kaalamang Katutubo. Uh, the opportunity to study uh, continuities or commonalities between and among parts of the Philippine experience that are normally separated. Uh, we normally separate colonial art, ethnographic art, modern art, etc. These are normally separate collections. As you can see, they're all separate collections. But to actually look at pieces from these various and divided areas of, uh, how, of cultural production in the past, uh, this is uh, this is hard to do, uh, especially if you're only examining, let's say, one bulul in one private collector's hands, and maybe ten bululs in another private collector's hands, and you can't see the range. You can't really make comparisons unless you're a dealer or, or a private collector. And finally, what is lost to Filipinos is an accurate analysis of Philippine of what is Philippine and thus to inform policy. And uh, this is my personal heartache that uh, government policy, um, corporate policies, uh, NGO policies and programming are not based on an accurate analysis of, uh, of what the ancestors produced, nor even uh, to reference what the, what the ancestors produced. Um, there was an earlier global inventory. I was in charge of it. 
um, it was an idea that I had. I pitched it to the National Centennial Commission for the birthday, the 100th birthday of the Philippines. And so uh, the, the late Senator uh, Lauren, uh, I'm sorry, the late Senator Leticia Ramos Shahani uh, allowed me to um, have an office at the Department of Foreign Affairs and to work with the Secretary of Foreign Affairs to have a global inventory done by the Department of Foreign Affairs through the ambassadors. Uh, so um, it was in 1995 to 2000. The Philippine Centennial was 1998 to be exact. Uh, the inventory consisted, can you imagine, it was hard copies of accession records that were delivered to the ambassadors. Uh, and uh, very few photographs. It was not digital. Even the Smithsonian was not digital at that time. And so um, it was done, but it's very hard to put it online. It's impossible to put it online. And so 20 years passed before interest uh, again um, was generated around the global inventory task. Now, I'm going to uh, show you some slides that uh, have red letters. And the red letters are um, like, my own devices uh, to remind me to tell you, to request you uh, to look into it uh, because no one, no one individual or institution can look into these things. For example, uh, even before the Centennial Inventory Project, there were many, many other efforts to track Philippine materials uh, and where they had gone. And uh, so it didn't begin with the Centennial Project. There were others, uh, not that uh, institutional, of course, uh, and how these left the country. But the foci uh, of this, uh, what we now really regard as antiquarian efforts through most of the 20th century were exceptional historical documents. People loved historical documents. And especially when it comes to, there is great interest in uh, things like um, Jose Rizal collected, uh, field, did field, uh, field collecting. So um, here's a documentation of material sent by Jose Rizal to the Royal Zoological Museum in Dresden, in Saxony, uh, from his exile in Dapitan. So this, is, this was the stuff of interest even before the Centennial Project. It still is the focus of interest. I find it to be curious uh, as an analyst. Uh, be well, for one thing, we have to acknowledge that anthropological field collecting was a foundational aspect of the discipline. Uh, and this photograph of what Rizal was looking for does show what his peers were looking for. Weapons, the spoons, uh, well, the spoons and the forks from Ifugao, and uh, brassware from Mindanao. Uh, this, this, you will find these items uh, repetitively all over the collection. So the 19th century was actually very much into particular forms. And uh, the, the collections in Europe are full of these forms and the collections in the United States. So my interest is not on Jose Rizal. My interest is why Jose Rizal seems to be one of those who are, well, we know that. I mean, there's, there's this big thing about Jose Rizal and what he represents about us as a nation, but uh, it deserves more analytic inquiry. But here are a few things that we all know about. I just want to breeze through it. Of course, the Manila manuscript or the Boxer Codex is in the Lilly Library of Indiana University in the United States. Um, it's the earliest uh, images of inhabitants of the Philippines. Um, this, there are three volumes the Doctrina Cristiana, uh, one in Spanish, one, believe it or not, in Baibayan, and one in Chinese. Um, printed, nobody knows which one was first, but it was all 1590 by stylographic uh, method. This one is in the Library of Congress. It's never lent. Uh, the University of Santo Tomas uh, for its uh, 400th anniversary of its library. And uh, it was the Dominican priests who actually printed the Doctrina Christiana, uh, were unable to borrow it from the Library of Congress of the US. You see, this one is the one in the Library of Congress. It has by buy-in. 
Uh, so it is um, absolutely important. So even if I, I have my own uh, reservations about an, an over-focus on heroes and heroic things, and because there are other things to be excited about. Uh, but in this case, this is quite exciting and uh, it's out of touch, out of reach, but we do have circulating copies. This is the one that in the, is in the Biblioteca Nacional in Madrid. Uh, it's the Chinese version. And it does give us an idea of what the Dominican priests were intending to do when they arrived in the Philippines, which was actually to use the Philippines as a jumping off point to evangelize China. Uh, so yes, I, 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 uh, I appreciate the, the excitement of historians. There's also this, which makes people rather proud. This is the Batalla de Lepanto, which is a massive painting by Juan Luna, uh, which is hanging in the Senado of Spain to this day. Uh, and it was, uh, well, it's, it's kind of fairly unknown to Filipinos, uh, but it was commissioned by the King of Spain at that time. So just going through the famous ones, but, those are only five of what's here. There, there are two lists. This is not a complete list. Tina uh, and I and, and the team are putting together a more, uh, a more uh, comprehensive listing. But each one of these have a substantial collections. So the Smithsonian has more than 10,000 materials. Uh, the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, of course, uh, is very proud of having uh, more than 10,000 pieces. But, uh, for example, the uh, Leiden Museum, and we're very grateful that Leiden is coming in, thank you very much, uh, is substantial. Uh, like I said earlier, the American Museum of Natural History has like uh, a fabulous Bagobo collection. So there, there are uh, some of these places have focused collections, but are indispensable for scholarship. All right. Some are very curious, like why is there a Philippine collection in St. Petersburg at the Kunstkamera, the Peter the Great Museum of Anthropology, uh, but there is. And we know that University of Michigan Museum of Anthropology is of course, um, all right, so here we go. Um, a capsule history of the diaspora of Philippine material culture. First, there were souvenirs from 400 years of colonization. Uh, then pseudo scientific and scientific expeditions from the 18th to the 19th century, American modern science expeditions of the early 20th century, antiquities trading in the 20th century, peaking in the 70s and 80s, and trafficking of what's little left, uh, which is ongoing right now. It is uh, continuing this piece uh, which is at the Felt Museum in Vienna, the former museum, um, museum for Volk and Kunde of Vienna. Um, this, is, this was collected in the 1980s, it's a very old piece, but you can see that there was uh, collecting that was going on. There are very interesting pieces uh, in the early part. This is ivory, uh, could be Chinese, uh, certainly uh, collected from the Philippines. I'm going to go very fast. Uh, now, Let's go to the red letters. The world expositions remain an urgent research area. Uh, this piece, is, uh, a piece like this came to Madrid because of uh, the universal exposition. And there's multitudes of materials that came in. Uh, very interesting from an aesthetic pers uh, perspective, like many of these things, but also very interesting from a historical perspective. Uh, and then uh, for scholarly purposes, you have paintings like this. This is also in uh, Madrid. Uh, of course, it's not only at the Museo Nacional de Antropología, there's Museo Naval, there's Museo de Ejército, there's all sorts of uh, museums in Spain. We did not finish the inventory in, 19, in 2000, we didn't finish the inventory in Spain, it was just too much. And we hopefully this time around, it, but we're in, uh, this is of interest to scholars, I think, be, uh, or should be of interest to scholars because of the sort of like uh, an elevation of what used to be the Tipos del País in, in the hands of a trained uh, artist. All right, um, very quickly, 
This is at the Metropolitan of New York. It's an unbelievable piece of um, doble calado. There's so many at the, the Metropolitan of New York. This is in the Museo de America, one of the earliest um, uh, collections from the Philippines, including plants and animals, which are in the Jardín um, Botanico uh, in Madrid. Uh, this is from the Malaspina expedition, which, uh, which was a vast undertaking. And uh, this beautiful uh, drawing of uh, Negra uh, in the mountains of Manila uh, is one of the earliest, aside from the Boxer Codex, of somebody looking back at us uh, from deep time. There are really rare things. This is one of those pieces that have no equivalent anywhere. It's a piece of gold uh, at the Felt Museum in Vienna. It was collected by uh, a peer of Jose Rizal, Mr. Schandenberg, uh, who was going around the Philippines collecting in. All right, so now I have to wrap up. I am going to just leave you with uh, the kind of intriguing thing that you will find Obviously, this is a great uh, weapon. It's a hilt, it's pommel, it's made of ivory. It's at the Metropolitan of New York. But there are these incisions on it. And we're beginning to find out how much of the weaponry, aside from their beauty, is, uh, um, is talismanic, which should not surprise Filipinos. A lot of it is also unbelievable in terms of metallurgy. A lot of it have exquisite form. And a lot of it um, is hard to now reconstruct technologically. This is steel and silver, as this one is. And this one, again, with the talismanic uh, thing. This is in Madrid at the Museo Naval. People in the Philippines do not know that there are there's armor. There's all sorts of armor. Uh, this is from several museums, but there's this too, another kind of armor, which is quite gorgeous. This is at the Musée du Quai in Paris. And lots of shields, which on their own should be studied for, uh, among other things, the relationship of shields among the Kalinga and tattooing, which is a hugely important thing to Austronesian peoples. Here is another, uh, I posted this on Facebook, so I'm not going to uh, dwell on it, but uh, truly the talismanic inscriptions are, are for scholars to read. All right, I'm going to pass through everything and just show you this little something which most scholars know about, but this came from an exposition in uh, the late 19th century and this too. Um, I have to wrap up. And so I am going to just go all the way to the end. But before that, I just want to show you this piece. This is the PS de Resistance at the American Museum of Natural History. It's just an absolutely, it's, it's an incredible Bagobo ikat. And an ikat in Pennsylvania, uh, which we have never seen in the Philippines nor this. Okay, I'll go to the very, very end of my presentation. Uh, all right. Mapping as a metaphor for future scholarship. I think the cartographies that are possible, necessary and urgent are maps of social relations within island Southeast Asian animist societies. And when I say animist, it doesn't mean just the people who are called IP. Uh, indigenous people, I'm talking about Catholics and Muslims who are also animist. Maps of technical aesthetic regions which run across political boundaries, they, uh, they go, they, well, you, you can't use provincial boundaries, you can't use municipal boundaries, and you can't use Philippines uh, national boundaries between Indonesia and the Philippines. So um, the technical aesthetic regions are really, really something to map. Uh, maps of changing identities, because these identities have been developing over time and have been developing because of uh, forces, uh, external and internal. Maps of indistinct borders and maps of dismemberment, things that are just so apart, like um, uh, the whole Mandaya, the whole, um, let's see, one, one entire ensemble of the Mandaya, uh, the hat is in Madrid, the clothing is in Leiden, the shield 
uh, is in Berlin. The, um, the spear is in the United States. Um, so it is a dismemberment and a remembering uh, is certainly something that we need to think about right now. Now, I know that I have to end, but I do want to go back to a little piece here. And it is unknown in the Philippines. This is Tala Andig. It's in um, the Field Museum. The exquisite nature of work by a people who did not build kingdoms is something that we should really be working on. Why, how, uh, and, and the, um, I suppose the spiritual nature, although it's very hard to use the word spiritual, um, about how a people or a group of people in, in an archipelago have become, uh, did make some of the most incredibly beautiful, heartbreaking things um, without what other people call civilization. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Marianne. Um, that was incredibly thought-provoking and heartbreaking, as you point out. Um, um, and I hope this project will go a long way towards um, at least um, raising some of the questions um, that uh, will be important in re reconstructing and remembering. Um, we're in, we now turn to Christina, uh, Christina Juan, who will um, give um, a, a brief uh, summary of the framework of the project, its range, and, and the processes that have um, brought, it, brought it about and um, that continue to um, um, populate uh, the database. Christina? Yeah, thank you. Um, I won't be long. I, um, this will be kind of brief. I'm really more like wanting to share um, with you kind of an introduction of like how to navigate uh, through these um, through the site. Uh, so uh, so now it's currently live. Um, so um, as to, as as Marianne has been saying, I think we have um, we have seen kind of the 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 amazing amount of um, items that need to be surveyed or cataloged or at least uh, be visible, uh, easily accessible. Um, uh, so in a way, we are thinking of this inventory as a sort of digital repatriation where we can give access uh, to material. Um, eventually, of course, if you go more into research, you might actually be able to see the objects, although it's kind of difficult sometimes. But then we hope to see that the inventory becomes uh, an overview gives a, a good overview of, of what's out there. Um, yes, Marion mentioned there are several um, attempts that have been uh, th that are there for individual like overviews for individual collections um, in in Branly and then of course Vienna and Leiden and and Spain. Um, uh, but then again, these are very kind of difficult to access, so we need to. Um, yeah, we've decided to put it all online. Now, the, the, the inventory features a search and mapping tool that you can use. Um, and what we're working hard on is our collections, the, not only a list of collections, but overviews for each of the collections, what, what is in the collection, the, the provenance, how it got there, how many objects, what are the highlights. So this will be a... a, a a very important feature of the inventory. So it's not just baseline uh, data, but the, the second layer of, um, of, uh, of content. And then we are uh, curating digital exhibits as uh, Marianne was saying, for example, this, this idea of dismemberment and trying to remember. Um, in this case, we might just be doing it digitally, but we are. Uh, there are several exhibits now um, live in the site where, for example, the Mandaya warrior is remembered in some sense through Marianne's essay by putting together these items um, in, one, in one essay. Um, another feature is um, we are looking at data and visualizing data. Uh, somebody mentioned weapons, for example. 
uh, as, as, as we keep going with the data, we will be able to figure out um, um, statistical um, patterns, you might say, like right now, um, I'll show you later, but um, yeah, there are, there's a very, there are big um, like word clouds, for example, what is frequently mentioned, uh, gathering everything that's in the inventory now, let's say uh, weapons, for example, is has the biggest number uh, in, in the inventory. So we'll see these types of uh, uh, data, uh, statistical data, which will also help us figure out the landscape of, um, and then of course we go to, um, we have another feature is this open, it's an open-ended inventory. And we basically really want to uh, um, collaborate with people, uh, ask for contributors, um, create a discursive space uh, for this inventory. So just a, a quick going through all of these features. Um, when you go in the site, you will have a, a, a search tool. You can put in ivory and it will uh, um, spit out as many um, pieces of ivory. There are some have are swords with ivory uh, pummels in them. Um, some, so, so yeah, we have a Boolean search and exact match. So you will um, be able to use those features. Uh, of course, the mapping tool will help us uh, help people maybe go, if you're in an area and you can see what museums and what they might contain in that area where you, where you are. Um, the other feature is, uh, as I said, the uh, collections, the overviews and the highlights in each collection. The Horniman has been very uh, generous in, in, in giving us their API, their data. Uh, very quickly, we were able to input into the system um, and, and they had graciously given us a very good overview of Philippine objects in their collection. And if we could replicate that with, I know, I mean, curators are very, very busy, uh, but if we can do that for each of the collections, um, just noting highlights um, um, and then just, yeah, put them all in one place. Um, so yeah, um, aside from that feature, we have, as I mentioned, the digital exhibits, and this is the example of the Mandaya uh, warrior that we're talking about. So you will be able to see Marianne's, um, um, uh, if you follow Marianne uh, on Facebook and she posts these um, uh, uh, mini essays, you might call, uh, we have uh, archived this in the site and we are, uh, linking it to each of the objects in the inventory. So you can tour the inventories uh, within the essay. Um, so there's like a digital tour, you might say. Um, the other feature is we are commissioning uh, contributors, um, scholars, uh, experts in the field. Um, uh, Mam Chita uh, has um, done a piece on ivory, on ivory pieces, Sandra on textiles and, and uh, Nina on um, uh, um, the uh, trousers, the silken trousers in uh, Leiden. So um, you will see those and we will continue to add on to these um, digital exhibits. So aside from Marianne's um, fairly regular contribution, we will hopefully get some other scholars to uh, contribute. Um, uh, so uh, these contributions are basically really um, looking at different objects in collections or, or, or an object in different collections and trying to uh, surface thematic parallels or um, maybe historical um, uh, historical uh, parallels, you might say. Um, so this is the dig digital visualization feature of the site. Um, if uh, I can't go now, but if you go to this page, you will see that um, you can play around with it. And of course, this data will, will change with time. Uh, you will see, for example, that um, of all the objects right now, there are uh, 1,500 objects in the, uh, in the inventory. And weaponry is, is, is uh, the most number in the collection that we have uh, uh, inputted. Sculpture, paintings, and then of course, ethnographic material. Um, we looked at uh, uh, data on the ethnolinguistic groups, uh, how many and where, and um, yeah, so just common statistical data and then visualizing it. Um, and 
and most importantly, we've we've we we'll, we've linked this um, inventory. Uh, we're making it as a discursive space, you might say. So we're linking it to Facebook or Twitter. <laughs> Some of you might not be, but it seems like the the most um, most active place for discussion. So one of the proudest um, moments I had was uh, when uh, when we were doing this. Uh, this uh, co-production of knowledge live on Facebook when everyone was just giving ideas and everything. Of course, there will be, um, you know, um, editorial uh, overview, etc. But then we, we just want that space to open up and discuss uh, things um, out there. So each time we uh, uh, feature Marianne's um, uh, new essay, for example, we will link, we will upload and then link to uh, the, the, the site, the Facebook site. And then all discussions can go there and then we feed back. Uh, for purposes of GDPR, we can't actually put the discussions on the website because that will create um, third party cookies. So we'll, we'll just go back and forth um, if, um, yeah, and yes, so this is the site, and uh, if you go to the site later on, you will see a contribute page. Um, there are two categories you can contribute, and you can also contact. Um, for contributing, you can, um, it's a Google form. Um, we're doing it as a Google form just because we can convert easily to a CSV file and then upload to the inventory. Um, but then um, what you, you can do is just go through uh, all the uh, Dublin Core uh, categories, if you know them. If if not, then you could you know you, you can just alert us if there are objects you're familiar with or or you know of, and then just put in your answers. And then um, this goes to um, uh, an administrative level where we could we can fact check, we can look at the the data, and then we can upload um, to the inventory. So I think that would be really I mean, if this endeavor will will succeed, I think that feature would be. The other thing that we we are hoping to do with uh, with this collaborative space is to get more images of some objects. Um, some, for example, this is from uh, I believe this is from the Horniman. So some objects don't have photos. Um, we're hoping to. Um, commission some photos for some of these really um, rare objects. But sometimes, you know, if you're in a museum and you can take pictures, we have made it um, possible to upload uh, uh, images to the Google uh, contribution form. And um, yeah, so that's it. Um, this is the, the, the site. Uh, uh, if, you, if you go in, you can play around and, uh, um, yeah, make suggestions. Um, uh, the other thing that I forgot was, uh, aside from contributing um, actual objects, you can also comment. And this is very important for a, our sort of other goal, which is to um, annotate some of the material that's already there. Um, most of the, the data that we have in the inventory is um, copied verbatim from the uh, holding institutions. So um, there is a sense where that's baseline research and we were hoping that people, uh, experts, or if you, if, you, if, you, if you feel like you, there's uh, the archaic information or there's um, misinformation or even you, you can, you are free to um, uh, suggest an annotation and we will of course credit your annotation uh, within the inventory um, once it goes through. Uh, fact checking and all these um, reviews. So that's about it. Um, uh, yeah, we'll be open for questions uh, for Nixie. Great. Um, am I, uh, could you um, uh, unshare your screen, Christina? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, I do welcome uh, or yeah, ask you to post your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat box. And um, we'll uh, and I'll direct these to the um, to the panelists. So our, our first question um, is to Marianne, um, and perhaps Christina would like to 
um, comment on it afterwards. But the first question relates to foreign service posts. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's actually two questions, uh, fr one from Kate Lim and one from Renita Rodriguez. Uh, first, uh, were there any efforts by the Philippine government to repatriate these items? And secondly, from Renita, um, how can Philippine Foreign Service Post support this project of mapping Philippine material culture overseas? Marianne. Marianne. All right. Um, I can only go so far as my own lifetime, right? So um, I recall, I didn't study uh, repatriation, but I was part of um, uh, certain formations that were studying repatriation around the time of the centennial of Philippine independence when uh, many Filipinos really wanted to repatriate. But there was a lot of noise around repatriation. In fact, the inventory that um, I proposed to Senator Shahani was a response to the call for repatriation because uh, you can't even begin a repatriation uh, um, initiative without knowing what's there. So um, it seemed like uh, even before we begin to talk about repatriation, we actually need to know what's out there. So that's the, the inventory. So while I said that uh, at the Department of Foreign Affairs in, in those years from 1995 to 2000, they did not, um, well, it didn't proceed very far because uh, things were not digital at that time. However, uh, it did give uh, certain sectors of uh, our foreign service an idea of what's out there. And certain ambassadors since then, in the last 20 years, have not, had then worked on uh, finding out more and doing exhibitions. Now, about repatriation, uh, it's a very um, it's a very dense discourse. The UNESCO has been with this dense discourse with uh, the Foreign Service uh, core of many many countries, not the least Greece. Of course, it's still trying to get its Elgin marbles from the British Museum and not succeeding. Um, but it has been a long haul. I just want to say that um, there, the Balanginga Bells were the only uh, focus of repatriation. And that succeeded eventually. It took 20 years. It took 20 years. Um, um, if I can answer, um, sorry, the second, for, the, second uh, the second question from Ren, uh, Foreign Service Post, uh, one of the things uh, that would be really helpful would be photos that have been published in uh, books, like government funded books, uh, like the uh, some of the books that I showed you, if there was a way we could um, get like low resolution copies even of, of those photos or, or I don't know, rights uh, to publish them online. Um, that would be really helpful. A lot of the, a lot of the museums now don't actually have photos of, of, of the objects and the, the more, well, the nicer photos are in those books. So if there was a way we could get some copyright um, transferred. I don't know. Um, of course, we we always emphasize that this is a, a purely academic work. We're not going to profit from this. So uh, a lot of our permissions have been based on that, and we will honor that. Um, um, yeah, commitment. Great. Um, we have a question um, regarding open data, open source. Uh, actually, a couple of questions. Um, one of these, let me, I'm scrolling through here. There are a lot of questions. Thanks very much, keep, keep them coming. Um, uh, so from Randy Noblesa, Dr. Juan mentioned open data. Is the inventory also open source as well? Uh, and um, related to that uh, from Almira uh, Giles or Gil, since the inventory is open-ended and public, will there be any effort at checking the validity of information shared? I think you addressed that partially, um, but um, of course, um, if it's open source, then uh, we have this um, sort of Wikipedia kind of uh, situation where potentially there might be uh, contestation of um, correct data. Could you answer uh, that, Christina? 
Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, um, in the spirit of um, open source, um, uh, yeah, it's definitely, we, you can uh, download the data, the entire data on the website. And if, if you know, for, for data visualization, you can do that. You can request an API key and um, we can give that to you. So you can, you know, you can download it as a CSV file and create projects based on it. I mean, this, the data that we're gathering is basically um, um, uh, of uh, Creative Commons license anyway. Uh, we are using Omeka as the a software tool, a very customized Omeka tool. And uh, that has features of, we would actually put up an API page, which you can um, look through and so you can use the data as well. Um, what was the other one? Uh, uh, open source. I think you answered both yeah. questions. Oh yeah, and uh, for, uh, Marianne, can you answer um, the, the second question? <laughs> All right, it's open source. Uh, so we don't want to obviously have a Wikipedia situation here where you, you're going to run after um, an, uh, data uh, that seems to have been misplaced somewhere or misplaced meanings. Uh, there is an editorial team that's, uh, uh, that's myself and Tina. Uh, and basically the, uh, the data is exactly what is in the museums to begin with. Now. Um, Tina also mentioned earlier that some of that data is probably old fashioned. Most, a lot of the data, you know, they use words like Moro, they use words like Negrito. I mean, obviously those are the obvious flaws of data that was encoded in the 19th century or early 20th century. So it's, it's, it's odd, the data is odd, but it, this is carried into the inventory, including all of those uh, flaws if you will, because it is important to scholars to actually read the original records. Now, uh, there are two ways in which the general public, the user of the database can, um, can supply additional information. That's how um, Tina uh, discussed the procedure. Um, but at the end of that procedure is editorial oversight. Uh, there will be editorial oversight. Thank you. Great. Um, we have a question from um, Ferris Tugade. Uh, this is such a great project. Yay. We all agree. When we turn in annotations, who does the validation? That's been answered by Marianne just now. But yep. um, the question um, I'd like to uh, address now to the panelists is what is the involvement of indigenous communities where these ethnographic materials emanate from? For, for example, Bagobo, Maranao, et cetera. Um, so, um, give yeah. it a go. Uh, it's like the rest of humanity. They, they have access to the data. And if in the future there will be opportunity for projects with them, that would be marvelous. That is actually something, uh, one of those projects that you, you can now conceive uh, can be done with an open source database. Yeah, and uh, for the, for the, um, uh, here in the UK, we, we are um, doing um, handling sessions, uh, digital <laughs> handling sessions, sorry, but uh, with the, uh, the, uh, the Ifugao community, uh, members of Igorot UK, that would be the dream, the co-production of, of knowledge. Yeah, that's a dream. <laughs> so um, uh, another sort of technical question is, uh, uh, there are two questions that were related. One from Car Carlos Nazareno. Uh, will there be efforts to make item labels amongst museums or in the website more accurate? So um, that's one. And then another um, related question is, um, if there are any corrections, how would these go back to the collections or how would they go back to the collections? Uh -huh. um, I want to jump in, uh, Nas, yeah. this is my friend. Um, Obviously, part of uh, an effort like this is the networking part. Um, as you can see, there was a, a great deal of networking from 20 years ago. And then now with the new people in charge of these museums all over the world, uh, then Christina and team now know who they are and are working with them. Um, because of that, 
the annotations, if validated, can go back to the museums. Uh, as a matter of um, practice, in any case, museum accession records have always had a, a provision for annotation, for further annotation and correction. The, the, the old, even the index card uh, accession records from the past had them. Uh, and certainly digital systems have uh, provisions for uh, further annotation with uh, the name of the person who annotated and the dates in they were annotated. So it's part of general museum practice. But in this case, it's now outside the museums because it is uh, it now belongs to the ether, so to speak. It 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 doesn't belong to anyone, uh, uh, but does belong to to the stakeholders. So in that respect, what you might uh, be able to look forward to is for annotations to become part of discourse amongst museums mm -hmm. and uh, discourse between the museums and this project. Mm -hmm. And in fact, stakeholders in the Philippines. That's true. Um, most museums also have a feature on their site for, you know, if there's any corrections or uh, I think like the, the Field Museum is very good at this and uh, the, the British Museum. So um, we we will probably not have the labor or the capacity to to feed back, but then I guess if the inventory becomes really a a, a very um, yeah very useful space, then it it will become in some sense a source for information as well for museums. Like right, like we we were just um, Nina. Uh, uh, Capistrano Baker, uh, just um, uh, there were no descriptions for the seven uh, uh, silk trousers in, in Leiden, for example, in the museum collection. Uh, so what she did was because she has seen them and she ha and, and she has written about them. So she has um, uh, made descriptions for each of them. Um, and this we will put in the inventory, of course, credit her uh, with the with a uh, name and date. And hopefully, um, maybe Leiden can see the use for this and um, feed it back to their own inventory. Great, we have a, um, several questions regarding um, the scope of the inventory. Uh, one person um, asked whether such a project uh, had been uh, already um, undertaken for collections in the Philippines, for instance. Um, and um, another uh, question raised the issue of uh, potentially bringing in Indonesian and Malaysian collections. And of course, there are um, actually several questions regarding um, collections in the US. So uh, one, uh, one attendee asked about the um, Field Museum um, Talandig uh, uh, object. So um, obviously these are huge archives. Um, where do you see this project uh, fitting in with um, that larger global project? You'll have to take the question, Tina. <laughs> <laughs> the Field Museum is a huge, huge collection. I think Almira is around. Uh, um, so we have actually been uh, thinking about because all of them are pro are online, I believe they have digitized everything and they have uh, curating. We're not sure we need to um, discuss it uh, if we are bringing it in. Um, ideally, we would uh, just for um, for you know completion statistical data. Uh, but we'll see. It, it is a very big endeavor. The Smithsonian has a whole number of collections as well, although. The Smithsonian um, does give you API, free access to their, and, and you can download the data. And uh, it, it's just very hard to navigate and look for these objects. Um, so yeah, it's an ongoing discussion. It's, it's a big project, but I think with a lot of help, we can complete it as much as we can. Um, to the question about, has this been done in the Philippines? Oh, yeah. um, okay, I'm not sure that I can answer this question adequately. Um, this is only from what I know of the projects over the past uh, 50 years that I've been active. Uh, certainly the national, the, the listed 
uh, materials by listed i mean they're, they're considered national treasures they're all they're all inventoried of course there's a national inventory for that um for total collections it would be per museum it's not consolidated um but the the hardest part about the philippines is that the that huge collections are in private hands and that at the moment i think that's fairly that, that's a very difficult proposition at this time for people to to get complete collections listed together yes um that was uh, uh the subject of El elric hundis's question Jundis. Um, who says, today many items are also in private collections. Some are important and exceptional pieces, as Marianne pointed out. Uh, will there be any move to allow those pieces to be documented in da databases? Um, how, how are we doing, Christina, on um, getting private collections in Europe um, onto the database? I have been in contact uh, with, uh, uh, Marianne, you probably know him. Uh, Malk Marlow mm -hmm. uh, from, yeah, yeah uh, 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 and he is willing to um, to discuss. Uh, I, I just saw his name because I, I think he did do an inventory of the weapons in um, in Stockholm, huh? or was it, Marian? Where is um, Sweden? I was in Stockholm. Or, yeah, yeah, he's in Stockholm. So yeah, yeah he said he yeah he's. Probably he is a he, he uh, did his dissertation, I believe, on the weapons and did an inventory on Southeast Asian uh, uh, weaponry in the in the collection. And but he also, I believe, owns the biggest uh, collection in 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 Sweden. So, yeah, there, uh, we will we will try, um, yeah, just to contact as many people network. As, as many um, as many points of entry as we can. Um, some are probably, I'm not sure how willing some people are to do that. Uh, and we will of course have to do um, uh, uh, photographs, high resolution copies and different things, but we're open to that, of course. Um, in the UK, um, one of the things I've been looking at are, um, um, Outside of museums, like the National Trust and the English Heritage, uh, there is a, a, a varied amount of um, um, objects from uh, that are stored in the in the um, in private collections, but under the National Trust. So yeah. that's that's another thing that I've been looking at, and like um, uh, Sir Richard Hyde Parker um, is is willing to contribute. He has given me permission to post the. Um, um, the the ivories that are at Melford Hall, for example, so um, that that would be a boost to uh, looking at how much Philippine material um, is in the UK outside of museums. Um, I'd like to just, I suppose, give um, um, come at the question from another direction, and it's uh, technical. Uh, with museums, there's hardly any deaccessioning. So when you when you enter an object into an accession record, it's there for a thousand years. I mean, it That's doesn't. Uh, with private collectors, the problem is uh, how to keep track of uh, where where the, the object went. So you may be able to put in an entire collection of a private um, collector. But in 20 years, it could have been dispersed again. So it's a different kind of project. Although I'd be very happy for this project to accommodate it to the extent possible. But there lies the difference. Private collectors, uh, private collections are fluid. They shift around a lot. Mm -hmm. That's true. Thank you, Marianne. Um, uh, that sort of next topic is uh, uh, with regard to uh, the enthusiasm uh, of museums and collection holders for this undertaking. Um, uh, Ramon Nocon asked this question, but um, I might rephrase it to uh, uh, include um, a couple of the other questions which um, raise the issue of potential partnerships uh, with specific institutions. Um, where do you, what would motivate um, um, a either public or private collection? 
to voluntarily uh, put their objects or make their objects available on this archive. Well, if it is a, if it is um, institution, it's a national institution like the British Museum. They do have a mandate for um, research, and um, with with things. With that being said, it's very difficult to actually like, you know, have an appointment, go in the storage area and look at these things. So, in some sense, for me, it might there it might be a way for them to, um, um, you know, um, uh, uh, do the mandate but, uh, by by contributing digital information and people can do research uh, and then perhaps go beyond that if they were really interested in one thing and then do the physical um, handling of the object. But in some sense, it is a way for them to achieve this mandate uh, for, yeah, for giving access to research. Because a lot of these objects are, uh, according to the data, um, I believe it's uh, three uh, five percent are on display out of the and a lot of them have never been displayed. And at a certain point you you question what they're there for, right? So in some sense, um, for a, an institution to give access even digitally, I think is a good enough um, reason. Um, um, I'd like to jump in and say a few things about the mood of the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, museums are changing. Yeah. Uh, I belong to a generation of curators uh, globally that were still part of a kind of 19th century formation, uh, which lasted until the middle of the 20th century. But by the time we were hitting the 1980s and 1990s, museums have uh, changed in rather fundamental ways. Uh, Part of it is because if museums do not change anywhere, it is even if it's in, in New York, even if it's in the metropolitan of New York, if they do not connect with, uh, with large audiences, they tend to be irrelevant. Uh, and museums have suffered for, from being irrelevant. So there's a lot of the work of museum curators and museum administrators right now is to connect to publics. And uh, those publics are exactly um, defined by the nature of their collections. Mm -hmm. So if they have, um, you know, a Vietnamese collection, they will automatically try and reach the Vietnamese community in Boston, for example. Uh, so um, museums have to connect now. Uh, it's not just mandate, it's a, it's a cultural shift. It's mm -hmm. an institutional shift globally. That's one. Uh, that's on the positive side. On the negative side, and this is also quite true, uh, there are calls for repatriation from Africa and from other parts of the world. And uh, I know that museums uh, have, have uh, answered these calls by saying it's online anyway. Uh, there, there doesn't seem to be a need to repatriate things because everything is accessible right now and they do try their best to, to go online and a lot of museums have gone online already. So yes, there's a positive and negative reason. Uh, and finally, there's a, there's a reason that might be, um, well, to be hoped for. Um, the, the French government under Emmanuel Macron has decided to actually return things. Uh, a lot of the contents of the Musée du Quai Branly is actually going to be returned to Africa. Uh, so in that sense, uh, knowing that this is going to happen to the world, uh, museums uh, are, are actually preparing themselves. So this is a kind of gentle preparation. Thank you. Um, another uh, question um, regarding um, potential uh, reconfiguring of uh, disciplinary boundaries. Um, the, uh, I'm trying to find the person who asked this question about Austronesia, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which has seemed to replace Malay um, as, a, um, as a, a nomenclature. Uh, 
how uh, how do you see this uh, fitting uh, this project fitting into recalibrations and remapping of um, disciplinary boundaries um, in um, studying material culture? Have a go at it, Tina, and then I'll follow you. I think I think having baseline the baseline data is it would be very helpful, and. Um, it, it just to just to get a really good picture of, of what's out there um, and putting them all in one in one kind of sortable grid will be very helpful as well. Um, like right now I was just looking at the shield with the inscriptions and then you can look for other objects in different museums which have which have inscriptions and so it'll just be easier uh, to figure out where things intersect, where they shouldn't, or, you know, um, so yes, Marianne. <laughs> um, all right, well, a lot of the, um, a lot of the material um, that have formed consensus within certain disciplines for the moment, uh, like the consensus in archeology span about the Austronesian expansion, uh, it may shift, but at the moment there's a global consensus on that. Um, it did not exactly, I mean, I, I don't think it's accurate to say that it replaced the word Malay because Malay has actually always been a language, not a quote unquote race. And, and race is a totally useless um, construction right now or category. So um, it's not a question of fitting this project into um, this or that discursive formation, it's to fit the project into uh, the consensus of the sciences at this time. So uh, we are um, we are really seeing the the project as existing within. Uh, well, it's a technical project, but it also exists within a historical time, and that includes the history of the disciplines. Thank you. And I, and I, um, sorry. Sorry, Thanks. go on, Christina, so, please. And I think that's why we, we early on decided to not just do pure data or journalistic data, you might say, but that we do have a second layer so that we, there is a space for, for shifts or for discussion, which might change over time, but, but we, we've always felt, I've always felt that we need the baseline data and from there put on the, the digital exhibits, the, the essays, hopefully some, some real projects from artists um, interacting or, you know, so that, there's always these two layers in my mind, but we, I do think that the first uh, sort of baseline data should be there. Great, and um, we're almost um, out of time. So um, I'm going to raise a question from one of our own team, um, Jessica Manuel, um, which uh, uh, was in the general spirit of um, decolonizing, um, as it were. Um, how uh, or are there any future plans put in place um, to get Filipino communities who might not have access to the internet and no access to this um, uh, inventory? Uh, to directly engage with these objects uh, through educational programs, for instance. Um, I, I'll give it a go. And then I really think that it's Tina who should wrap it up. Um, so to me, uh, uh, even in uh, 1995 to 2000, the idea was build the archive, build the archive. There's many projects that can be done if the archive is there. Uh, you don't have to start from scratch. Uh, if you want to put up an exhibit on Ifugao sculpture, you you will know where things are. You will know who owns what. That's that's a lot of research done already, uh, and, and so it allows it facilitates projects on solid ground, so to speak. 
Uh, and that is what an archive should be doing in the real world. An archive is not an archive to be lost in, in the midst, mists of time. An archive mobilizes people. So in this particular sense, I think it will mobilize people to, to do projects. That's to be hoped. Uh, thousands of projects, if possible. Um, we, we don't have to do it anymore like we used to do. I, I, I have a little bit of an anecdote. I brought um, an Ifuga sculpture to the storage of the the Smithsonian ones, um, hoping that, uh, of course, it would be the beginning of this um, remembering uh, of this um, coming together of sculptor and sculpture in, in a foreign land. Um, it's not really as easy as you might think. Um, he wept when he handled the materials at the storage of the Smithsonian. and. Um, he, he got ill and he, he was ill upon return to the Philippines uh, for about six months. Uh, so these are delicate projects. Um, I think we have a, a, a rather defined view of what this uh, inventory can do, which is to provide a database, that, that, to provide the, uh, the foundational premises uh, which allows for change, which allows for metamorphosis, but the projects will have to be conceptualized differently. The project will have to be con conceptualized with actual human beings touching things. And in the case of uh, my friend, the Ifugao sculptor, um, he did say eventually that, um, or it was known that he got sick because of the connection with the past. He, he got well. So those are different projects. Christina, would you like to provide a, you know, bang up um, conclusion um, as we um, thank you uh, for all your questions um, and um, unfortunately cannot answer all of them um, in the time allotted. Um, so I'm, I'm going to hand it over to Christina to uh, give our final words. Yeah, so thank you so much for uh, joining us. Thank you for the enthusiasm. Um, uh, please go ahead and play with a with a with a research tool. I would um, um, somebody will be monitoring the questions, the contribute pages, uh, and we will get back to you. Um, um, uh, if there are any other questions that haven't been answered, um, I will take a note of them and, and answer them. Um, but yes, hopefully we'll, we can all work together on this. Uh, I think it would be a, an amazing thing to have. Uh, Maria? Okay. Well, I just want to thank uh, Dina and your team and <laughs> Nixie. Uh, it's a long time coming as, you, as I already um, narrated. Um, and it, it will, I think it bodes well. It is a decolonization, but a very um, technical decolonization, which is the way I want it. <laughs> which is the way I, I think I think these things uh, ought to happen because it's 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 built on on stronger uh, foundations. Thank you, everyone. Um, I Thank hope you. to uh, to see um, everyone's tapping away and, and going into the site. Um, <laughs> Thank you for Thank you for joining our webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Can I, can I save the chat? Sorry. Yes, it's all saved. How? Where? Um, it, you can, if, it, if you oh, recorded it, we'll save the chat as well. Oh, okay. Oh, I should end it? Yes, please. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>